Uh, today we are uh, you know here to to talk about a very important issue, something that concerns and affects all of us, but something that you know not all of us are completely aware of. We've been hearing about this, we've been talking about this, we've been told this is important and mandatory. But you know, what does it actually mean for us? You know, what does it do? And we are talking about the Aragya Setu app, but not just about the Aragya Setu app. Let me set a brief context before we go to before we I hand it over to the speaker for today. The COVID pandemic has shaken the world over, right? Everybody has been affected by it directly or indirectly. And uh, to counter this, you know, the government has taken you know multiple steps, including you know, forcing upon a lockdown, testing, some of these things. It's a matter of debate if it's been effective or not. Has the testing been sufficiently done? Uh, which I don't think is a matter of debate, but you know, we are not talking about those things today. What we are going to talk primarily about is, is about this app that the government says is very, very useful and important in tracking down COVID cases. And uh, in fact, the government has went so far to say that it is mandatory for people to install this application if you're traveling. We have seen this already being implemented in Delhi and also parts of Andhra Pradesh, where even if you are to travel by a bus, let alone a train or a flight that it has been told that you know, you'll have to mandatorily have this. And what is my mean by mandatory? If I do not have this application, you know, there are you know, there are talks that you know this could be if you do not have an app, this could be a criminal offense if you do not have this. You know, but we would like to understand more about this RQ Setu app. What does it do? What are the pitfalls? What are the dangers? Is there any advantage to having it? All of this, you know, to answer all of these things and to take us through. Today we have Srinivas Kodali. Srinivas is a researcher at uh, the Free Software Movement of India. He has been, uh, you know, researching on internet, e-governance, policy issues, data, and is, you know, well known for his, uh, you know, the news that he brought around the Aadhaar and the leaks around Aadhaar, how they affect common people. He was also involved in, in, in. And in digging out the reasons behind the voter deletion list uh, last year, you know, most of you would remember, you know, what was the, or how did the government use the Aadhaar database, linking it with the electoral rolls, and which eventually led to, you know, millions of people losing their right to vote. And we have Srinivas Kodali today, uh, who will be taking us through this thing. And we have Prashant. Prashant will be moderating the session. Uh, friends, we do have a lot of questions already coming up uh, in terms of the security. How is this, uh, you know, any better than the other uh, data surveillance apps like Facebook, Instagram. We are going to get into all of the questions in just a bit. But before that, we would, you know, again, uh, need to have some context before we get into the questions. Do not worry. All your questions will be answered by uh, Srinivas. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, please do go ahead. Uh, you know, please do, uh, please do post your comments over there. Your comments, please do also note that your comments will be moderated. And hence, there might be a slight delay uh, after, after you post and the comment appearing on the page so you know make you know, probably a half a minute delay for that don't don't worry about that you your questions will come up over here all right uh, over to prashant and uh, srinivasi srinivas all right thank you right uh, good evening everybody and welcome to today's uh, discussion on arogi situ app and related subject uh, uh, srinivas has already been introduced so i won't take any more time and so uh, uh, this session will be, uh, Srinivas will be speaking for around 30 to 40 minutes, after which we'll come to the questions. And yeah, over to you, Srinivas. Okay, so before I go into the issues of the security, privacy, and other technical aspects of the app, I want to just set a brief context of where data comes in healthcare. And why do you need data to solve healthcare issues? So to, to give a brief background, uh, let me take you back to a similar epidemic uh, back in the 19th century. I think it's around 1870s. I'm not exactly sure of the year, but this is the time when there was cholera outbreak in London. And you would see that people are contracting cholera and they're dying. And cholera is a disease which actually originated in India. It kind of got exported through the East India Company uh, vessels, which were taking back a lot of raw materials from India for the Britain's industrial revolution. Now, nobody at that point of time in 19th century had any idea how cholera was spreading or how it needs to be stopped. So it was an epidemic of a large magnitude. A lot of people died. and. Uh, this is a point of time in history where public health infrastructure did not exist. Like the practice of medicine was evolving, 
it's not that that you have right now with modern public infrastructure where you have hospitals or ventilators and so many drugs uh, healthcare drugs so what happened during the uh, cholera outbreak was essentially in london particularly in the street called the broad street in soho uh, this was the place where a lot of people were dying because of cholera or they were affected because of cholera and people were trying to investigate how it was being spread was it airborne was it waterborne was it going through contact how was it spreading there was this doctor called dr john snow and he was uh, he was basically trying to investigate how how cholera was spreading so what he would do is he would take up a map mark up every patient's location of where he has contracted cholera or where he used to live and he eventually uh, deduced from this map that all the people who contracted cholera were basically near few public water wells so essentially cholera was being spread through water pumps and to stop it he essentially ensured that the water pumps were sealed and so that's the primary source for the cholera outbreak and once they stopped the water pumps nobody was drinking this uh, water pumps which which were spreading cholera so they averted the outbreak so this is the origin of statistics or usage of statistics in healthcare and it was done by a doctor and john snow is widely known as the father of epidemiology which is the subject of using statistics for healthcare response and healthcare in healthcare there are various branches as you know but epidemiology in particularly deals with epidemics and currently which which is the one we have it's a pandemic because it's across the world now there were multiple uh, advancements in this field but at the same time there were also multiple advancements in public health care uh, over the years people realized to ensure that epidemics do not spread you need to increase public health care infrastructure essentially you need to have lots of government hospitals primary health care centers you need to ensure that people have nutrition so that say even if some people uh, because of lack of nutrition are contracting certain diseases they could pass on to others right so you need to improve immunity of humans and the only way to do that is investing in public healthcare systems and investing in nutrition of everybody uh and we have done that over the last century from 19th century to even now we are in 21st century or the last one century we actually improved all of this but apart from this Uh, to tackle epidemics what people also realized was that we need to be actually searching if there are any new unknown diseases that, that are originating so there were centers for disease controls that have emerged uh, so one of the epidemiologists the chief epidemiologist at the us uh, center for disease control center in the 1950s now i forgot this particular doctor's name but what he essentially proposed a term called health surveillance during a talk that he gave this was the first time uh, the where someone was using the word surveillance to detect epidemics and the reason this was being proposed was that that we did we do not know how where and how an epidemic could originate right so you have to consist, constantly look for new forms of disease that one could be contracting and that's what the who does and so post 1947 post the, the world war 2 and the the un and the who being set up uh, the primary place where all of this was being carried out was at the who so when this uh, epidemiologist chief epidemiologist of the us center for disease control then proposed this idea uh, who actually started understanding its value and started implementing or adapting it it from 1962 and then uh, it it kind of became important post the uh, the sars corona virus outbreak in the late 90s 99 early 2000s which actually killed a lot of people and this is the point of time that india realized that india never had an actual healthcare surveillance infrastructure because uh, you had sars corona virus outbreak So, uh, there are the SARS virus outbreak in our neighboring country, and we barely survived through it. 
so we started india started spending money or uh, building up infrastructure for healthcare surveillance or what is popularly known as disease surveillance so the program name for it was called the integrated center for disease surveillance i guess icds that that's what the program was where essentially this entire department within ministry of health would be looking at how disease surveillance need to be done and post that you have actually used this form of disease surveillance in india say for diseases like tuberculosis essentially communicable diseases which could spread uh, not necessarily something like the coronavirus but all forms of diseases right so you're not looking for something in particular but at the same time you are keeping an eye out so that there is no out outbreak and this this was set up in early 2004 now coming to the coronavirus pandemic uh, one would anticipate that the first point of uh, reaction to something like this to an epidemic would be by the ministry of health would be particularly by epidemiologist at the icds program because that's, that's not what happened right like india's uh, integrated center for disease surveillance is actually dead they haven't been sharing any data any information that they have been collecting about the coronavirus for a while now instead what you get is an app an app which is developed by volunteers uh for ministry of electronics and information technology essentially it was supposed to be doing contact tracing contact tracing again is a healthcare practice where uh, you would send healthcare workers to try to identify where someone has probably contracted a particular disease exactly like what john snow did essentially marking out every person where they live and how they could have contracted a virus so usage of statistics in healthcare is perfectly all right and usage of data is actually great but the problem is the ones who need to do it are essentially doctors and healthcare workers so what you had in the case of arogya setu was you had a bunch of technologists who were not even inside the government who were actually private players who volunteered apparently uh, so we don't know under what conditions right so uh it was according to newspaper reports it was the Min ministry of electronics and information technology secretary who called one of these people to ask uh, ask them to get one of these apps and this is how arogya setu was born but while this was happening i think uh, the nic uh, also built one more uh, app it was called the corona kavach uh, it barely saw the light of the day it was available on play store uh, google play store for a while and it was uh, was withdrawn because niti ayo wanted uh, arogya setu so we really don't know how this app exactly came up but what is being told to us is that it was essentially built by private partner private partners through a public private partnership the entire details of this public private partnerships are unknown now let's come into the app itself how does it work and can one actually uh no if they have contracted coronavirus through it so the app essentially uses your bluetooth and gps location data to identify your movement patterns and try to understand to whom all you have been in contact with provided the other person also has this app installed essentially it's exchanging data with whom you have met because your bluetooths are in range so if you're in in a close range with someone else the app would know and there are claims that the app does not share this data or does not upload this data to a server until you actually say that you have done corona positive you have done corona covid positive so essentially if i turn positive i have the app i report it in the app that i am now positive after i i go through a test everyone who came in contact with me because of my bluetooth will get an alert saying that oh, hey you might have been in contact with someone who might have contracted the coronavirus so you should go get it tested or you should take care of your health the essential idea is this now the problem is does this work what does it take to work what are the ideal conditions for this to work uh, we all know that half of india's population does not has smartphones even if it has smartphones it does not has the internet so so one could essentially say that 
at max there are 500 million people who could use this app but even the, within those 500 million people not all of them have this android or ios phones right you have around 300 million people using geo phones uh, which are non android so the app right now is only for ios and android phones there are reports that they are going to get a ios version of it which is the operating system that geo phone uses now even when these many people use the app, it's likely that you will be meeting or interacting with someone like a shop buyer, your milkman, who essentially does not has this. So there is a chance that your app is, is not going to record that you have contracted coronavirus from someone. So you will never know. There will always be false negatives. So, so if you have coronavirus, and the state needs to actually identify where you have got coronavirus, they will have to do manual contact tracing because the app is useless in this case, even though you have it, because the other person can't afford to it. At the same time, there could be false positives where essentially you and your neighbors are in a uh, Bluetooth range. You could be sharing, could be living walls apart. There is no airflow. It's not being transmitted, but you're exchanging Bluetooth. I think false positives are not a problem. If someone is alerted saying that, hey, you might have corona, then I guess that person could be, be in a position to take care of themselves or go to a hospital to get tested, except that's not happening. We're not testing enough. So, so alerting one person or collecting data of people who are in touch with other coronavirus patients is useless when we are not providing that basic healthcare infrastructure. A rather better use of things is actually ask people to wear masks and promote mandatory wearing of masks by actually freely distributing these masks. But we are not doing that. Instead, what we are doing is we're actually forcing people to install an app. And this happens because there is a false sense of techno solutionism, which is that technology can solve everything. And that's primarily being promoted by the private sector, which has business interests in this. If one asks what are the business interests of private sector in this app, uh, some of the volunteers who were involved with building up the Aritya Setu, especially the person who led it, Laldesh Katrakata, is actually a volunteer of a group called Icebird. Uh, you can go onto their website and you'll find his name. And he has been working, or rather the group has been working towards building something called the National Health Stack, which is something this group has promoted uh, from 2017. Media yeah. has conducted a consultation pro process for this in 2018. Then uh, National Health Stack kind of became what was called the National Health Digital Blueprint at Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Now it's back at Niti, and somehow National Health Stack is on the roll because Icebird is actually uh, working on it, and they're hosting open houses where they're saying, oh, oh, we are building this National Health Stack. Now, the key question is, what is National Health Stack and why people should be afraid, or what is the story of Arake Setu? Arake Setu is, a, is an app through which uh, private sector can push or access health data records of individuals through the health stack. So essentially, if you're using an app, Bharat Health Stack becomes the server or the back end of it. So while Aroge Setu is currently only collecting limited data of individuals like location and Bluetooth, and even though they are claiming not all of this data is being uploaded to the server, but the moment you register, it actually collects your location data because if you, if you have used the app, or if you've seen screenshots of the app, you would see that the app actually informs people how many people in their neighborhood have turned positive and how many people in their neighborhood have installed the app. And it gives you an option of radius of 500 meters, one kilometer, two kilometers, five kilometers, and 10. Essentially, this is a, they are able to do this because they know where you are. They know your location. And they collect this location in certain scenarios, which is the first time when you register, and also when you report that you have turned COVID positive. They're trying to track location where somebody is reporting that they have turned positive. So essentially, you need that location data. But at this stage, your Bluetooth and other location contact history is also uploaded after you report that you have turned COVID positive. 
But when there are fa false claims or rather part claims being claimed that the app only collects data when and if and only if you turn positive is wrong. It always collects data the moment you install it. Post that, this brings the question of privacy, security on things, right? Like, is uh, there is a difference between privacy and security. Privacy is for you as an individual. Security is for the database, for government. So if someone like, say, an uh, enemy country like Pakistan, which also has been floating fake Arogese to apps for people to install, and which is why you have the Indian Army saying, do not install this app, because we don't want you to send location data, which is sensitive in nature. Say someone like Pakistan is able to access all of the location data of every Indian. Now, that's a security issue. What's a privacy issue is essentially if your data is being is available to someone you don't want. So say someone like uh, someone who is essentially from an opposition political party in the country, say from the Congress, from the uh, from of some one of the regional parties or any other party who is in the opposition, and he installed the app, installs the app. The government now knows where this person is. Uh, and that's a privacy risk for this individual. So the moment you install this app, you are giving away your data, so you essentially have a privacy risk. Now, the question is, OK, fine, I will install this app. Whether uh, I'm giving some data, will it work? The, the answer is no, because the app cannot solve a healthcare crisis. Can it help with statistics to solve the healthcare crisis? Even that, not so much, because we are seeing that how data or statistics is not being transparently reported by several states in the country, be it be Delhi, Telangana, or any other states, or even when you are actually with symptoms, when you're going to the doctor, you're unable to get tested. So in that sense, this app is useless. But there is a use for this app, and that is essentially for private sector to actually monetize Indians' health data records. And, and that's, a, that's something that the Indian government has been saying for a while now. 2018-19, uh, uh, the economic survey, in the economic survey, the chief economic advisor in, in chapter four, part one, uh, the title of the chapter is essentially data of the people, by the people, for the people, where the chief economic uh, advisor actually proposes this idea saying that all the data that the government collects for providing welfare to citizens, essentially if you're receiving subsidies in any form, whether it's uh, food subsidies, whether it's uh, kerosene or uh, uh, gas subsidies, right? Most of us get gas subsidies. All of this data has some value and the Indian government should sell this data to enable uh, private sector participation. Uh, the economic advisor proposes this idea that data is a public good and one should use this for economic development. And India has been promoting this idea, uh, which has been primarily promoted by Mr. Nilakeni when he built the ADA program and he wrote this report called the TAGUP report, which is Technology Advisors Group uh, Upcoming Projects, I guess. Uh, that's the report he wrote in 2012. And that's the report where Nilakeni proposes GSTN, so India builds a GSTN. He proposes what was called the in National Information Utilities. So you, so you have Aadhaar, you have GSTN, you have UPI, and you have a wide range of these systems. And all of these systems, or most of these systems, were built by volunteers outside the government. They are not built by the government of India. And in case of GSTN, it was actually the Infosys. But it was... Oh, architected by this guy called Pramod Verma, who also claims to be the architect for other and who also happens to be associated with lots of Nilakeni foundations and this group called iSport. So what you're witnessing in India right now is a bunch of private players who are actually building every other government software for a private interest. So if you look at other, some of these volunteers who built other came out of it, started their own companies on top of other data. Then you had, uh, in case of UPI, even some of the people who were associated with iSport had early access to the UPI APIs. So other companies cannot or do not have access to it. For example, I or, I or anybody else cannot build an app because you will not get access to the APIs. Similarly, the, the national health stack that one is building, the access to these APIs essentially means some of the private companies will be able to build the next wave of health tech companies. 
So there are a bunch of companies that are involved in this alliance called the Swast Alliance, who are working with iSport to bring out, to build the national health stack. And iSport actually raised some money from this group called the ACT Grants, which is an industry, uh, industry volunteers or individuals who came together to raise a 100 crores fund to invest in any of the company solutions which can solve the coronavirus. And iSport has a grant to build what is called the national health stack. And national health stack essentially rides on the back end of Aruke Setu. So what you're witnessing is what was supposed to be a, a healthcare response hijacked by a bunch of volunteers term, being turned into an uh, economic, uh, how do I put it, uh, an economic hijack of sorts, right? Like, so you're taking over government, you're, you're building a lot of government infrastructure, you don't have any agreement with the government bodies, even if there is an agreement, it waves off your liability. So essentially, if you build any system in an unsecured way, the volunteers are not liable for it. And the Ministry of Information and Technology or the NIC is not is not in a capacity to verify these issues. So whenever you have a bug, whenever you have a security issue, you always have to go back to these volunteers asking them, hey, we have this issue, so come solve it. So this is actually increasing dependence of government with these volunteers who, who tend to gain with this close connections of this public-private partnership where the risk of this app not working is passed down to the public while the private sector profits from the data. This is something that we don't need. What you actually need for this pandemic is actually a public healthcare response, which is like you need lots of hospitals, you need lots of ventilators, you need healthcare workers, you need doctors, you, need masks, everybody needs a free mask, right? If they can't afford it. But we are not witnessing any of that. Uh, I'll come back to the whole issue of privacy arguments that were made, security issues, and how, why people were afraid of it. So when initially when the app came, a lot of people were actually afraid how the app even works. They didn't want to install it because they don't know what it was and how it was going to work. And this came at a point of time in uh, Indian democracy where Indians started to question government data collection in general because India was supposed to do the national population register, build the national population register, which was going to lead the national register of citizens, the NRC, part of the census of 2021, which led to a lot of protests in the country. So <clears throat> the whole uh, uh, set of people who were opposing CAA were were afraid, right? The communities in India were essentially afraid. And, and this also comes in the backdrop that the Indian government in the Supreme Court took a position where that Indians do not deserve a fundamental right to privacy. All of this combined with, after, even after three years of the Supreme Court has said that Indians actually have a fundamental right to privacy, the Indian government has not actually brought a privacy law. So all of these combined it, it, it created a factor where people started questioning the government, saying, hey, why should I download this app? Why are you making it mandatory? So anytime any any institution, whether it's government, whether it's your own uh, boss in, in a private company, pushes something on to you, people tend to uh, question things, right? Like, why am I being forced to do this? Why should I do this in the first place? So that also created a lot of trust issues. And the only way the government could explain what the app does was essentially by open sourcing the code to actually show how the app works. So that's what the government did uh, two days ago, three days ago, when they released the source code of the Aruge Setu after a lot, lot of demands. Now, what does the source code tell us? The source code essentially shows us that when and in what scenarios the data is being collected whether it's being transmitted in an encrypted format. All of this is actually true. A lot of the claims that the government makes in regards to data collection, I'm very being very specific in regards to what data it collects is, is right, except that the app collects location data the moment you install it. So you can verify some of these and you can test whether it's secure or whether you can you can even probably modify. Now does this solve the healthcare crisis at hand? No, in, in, in no way it, it actually helps solve it. One could essentially say maybe it's helping people to identify these red zones where uh, there is a spike in coronavirus numbers. 
unfortunately i would disagree with anyone who's saying that because a lot of people who are coming with symptoms are not being tested in actual hospitals so if you're saying that uh, okay fine if uh, say states are rejecting these people so if somebody can install this app and report their corona positive even then we do not have the healthcare infrastructure to deal with them the reason why people are being rejected when they turn up at the hospitals is that we don't we do not want to show that there is a spike in number which could create a panic so they're not even testing all they're advising people is to go back to their houses and just lock themselves up but that's not the uh, the that's not the way house healthcare solution should work right so in the end what what this is 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 a complex nexus uh we are in a post truth world where governments don't want to give you numbers but want to collect all of the information about you so that a private sector or a set of few people benefit from this and uh, you can verify a lot of this that i'm stating by actually going up and looking for national health stack uh, and the, as i was saying niti has already conducted few consultations of it and they should be online you can also go look for the national health digital blueprint which talk about it, which talks about health data exchanges where all of your health data is collected and it will be shared with uh, say hospitals when you want to share it with them so and and the reason i say this is this is what is going to happen is because any infrastructure that's built during a crisis never never goes away one can say that hey what if after all of this uh, after we solve the coronavirus problem which only can be done with the vaccine and i completely support that vaccines need to be made mandatory i'm not being unscientific here i'm just being pragmatic where you need to be real realistic does an app solve a problem no but uh, humans do doctors do so only when we get a vaccine this goes away and the idea is if and when it goes away will this app go away no it will exist it will probably morph into something else but essentially the idea that you need to be sharing data to get healthcare is something is it's going to become a reality and this idea of that you need to give data to get welfare from the state is something which has started with with the other program which nilakeni brought in through his free market ideas where he says that the free market or the market will solve all the problems the government has no capacity to solve anything so privatize everything and that's what is happening now even the health sector where you see that the private sector is trying to put in itself in a position where you are forced to go to them and that's dangerous because what this pandemic has shown us is that we need to be investing a lot in public health care infrastructure instead of doing that you are turning away people you are not testing them you are not giving them any public health care but instead you are going out and helping the private sector because you know that you can't do anything but the, at the end of the day if 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 that's the idea if you want to sell my data at least pay for me is some is is one of the ideas that's being pushed even that's problem because this idea that one should share their data sell their data for health care is not going to solve because uh, solve our healthcare problems because we still need doctors hospitals and other he healthcare equipment so the, the problem essentially that you are witnessing is lots of uh, governance infrastructure is being privatized and private players are taking it over and they are reducing you from citizen to a consumer you can ask government a lot of questions as a citizens because you have rights and and the government's obligated to uh, provide you these Uh, benefits but to a private sector to a private party what right do you have you are a consumer and consumers as we know have always been ignored throughout history like you pay up or you don't get the service uh, and that can't solve this virus because it only shows that if you want to eradicate the virus you have to eradicate it with everyone including the poor people if even if one poor man has this virus it's always going to come back vaccine or no vaccine there will always be a section of population which will be affected by this uh i will end it there and i'll take more questions but it's it's not a technology problem for these volunteers or technologists to start providing an app 
an app is not going to help us in any way and i have this quote that i keep saying if the aragya uh, setu app can solve the corona virus crisis i can do an open heart surgery with a screw driver which is a wrong tool right you need a doctor an experienced person and with the right set of tools to do it and aragya setu is not the tool let's see us uh, thanks for that uh, so yeah we have already a uh, few questions lined up uh, let me go through one by one so one of the questions is uh, i want to understand how much of a privacy is breached compared with uh, twitter facebook insta and inbuilt apps of chinese smartphones that is one of the questions yeah okay i think so so privacy is something is is a strange construct right it's not entirely understood by everyone it's a different thing for different people uh for for a woman uh privacy means uh safety uh for a man sometimes privacy could mean uh being in a position to do whatever he wants uh, and it's a bad thing in a, in a bad way right so it's but for say vulnerable communities for say for muslims privacy means them being discriminated or not being discriminated so in terms of when you compare these things it's 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 very individual so if you want to compare this app with say twitter or any of the social media sure the social media uh, companies are collecting your location data so is this app uh, but the problem is this location data is being uh, collected by the government of india which has the power of violence with it which is that it can send police to your house google facebook or any of the chinese companies may not be in a position to harm you directly they are definitely in a position to harm you through your data where they could sell it with third parties where uh, say you if you have to pay for uh, health insurance and they know that you have been going to bars and smoking definitely uh, you could be harmed but the harm that an institution like government can do is different compared to what social media companies can do so whether a privacy violation has happened uh nothing so far that would probably affect any of you uh but but the other question is should you even be bothered with the privacy and i think i think one should uh, ask the government to get a law right when in scenarios where this can happen they could seek a recourse but at the same time even if with the law uh, would would one support uh, a mandatory installation of this app no because it doesn't work what you need is mandatory masks okay uh, one more question is uh, uh, is the app secure and have there been any security audits or the reports done by government uh we are not actually not sure about any security audit reports uh we don't know frankly uh but because the app source code has been now made there are actually a lot of people who are filing bug reports on github and there are instances in the past where they did agree there were minor instances where some data was being sorry some data was being shared with third parties right so so is the app secure for now yeah uh, but again as i was saying security is a construct uh, so where there are other malware apps similar to aragya setu was there a duplicate app which pakistan was uh, was sharing to indian army soldiers yes so at some level that has affected our security to what extent one probably needs to look at it but security does not mean that this data has leaked it could come in forms that one can't anticipate okay uh going to go to the next one uh all right so uh many uh, many countries are using co uh, contact tracing technology to fight against covid are they are they all using big data uh, or some kind of app if yes uh, how arogya setu is different or more dangerous in comparison to them okay so uh, the perfect example that's always given when we talk about uh, contact tracing apps is that from singapore uh, which is called the trace together app so the trace together app uh, 
which is again open source, uh, uses a protocol called Blue Trace. And it only collects Bluetooth data. It does not collect location data. Uh, and the idea is that, essentially, when you come in contact with someone else, uh, you have your Bluetooth keys that are exchanged. So, And most of the other apps around the world also do this. Uh, so when one has to compare with them, I think there are different parameters where one can compare it with uh, how much data does the app collect and in what scenarios and, and who gets access to this data. And all of this essentially can help rank them. I think uh, there is a database of all contact tracing apps, which MIT Tech Review maintains. So one can go look at all of these apps. But the point is, how have been international uh, applications of this app? Was there success anywhere else? And the answer is no. Like 40% of Ireland, uh, or Iceland, I'm not sure, uh, 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 one of these countries have been using the contact tracing app, and it did not help them. Even in Singapore, where we are saying this app is great, the developer of the app itself agrees that this can't this can't fully take away contact uh, manual contact tracing, and you actually need healthcare response. So, and the problem that Singapore did is Singapore ignored a lot of its uh, immigrant population, which is there in Singapore from the rest of South Asia, with Sri Lanka, India, uh, Vietnam, and elsewhere, Cambodia. Where, who were in Singapore and doing all the construction work of building Singapore's buildings, Singapore ignored them initially. And that increased their contact, uh, increased their coronavirus numbers. So the thing is, you can't focus on these smartphone users across the world. There are poor people who actually live on the streets who can't afford daily food. And expecting that they are going to have a smartphone and that they are going to know when the virus contacts them is, is not being pragmatic. Right? It's a fool's errand that I am going to sell you something that it will work in all scenarios. It does not. So all of the apps that are working out, uh, coming out of in the world are rather just designed for the rich. And I would just call, call them toys, which don't work. Uh, next question would be, uh, uh, why does the app seek user consent when the government has made it mandatory for all the office workers to download? And how, how do we force government to make changes to the app if there is no choice? OK. By changes, I'm assuming changes to rules. OK. Uh, I think, see, uh, for, for this app to work, a section or significant section of the population needs to use it. And they were already aware of this, right? Then the only way to get that significant, significant population was essentially to force it down on people. Uh, but this comes with a belief that this app can actually solve, it can actually help. But nowhere, nowhere in the world, it can actually, it has been proven that it can help. OK, the except the, the other use case one everyone actually cites is China, where the virus actually originated. China is that state where surveillance is at an extreme level. And you have China, which is collecting everybody's data, uh, which is 100%. Right? Let's see, everybody in China has a phone, and China, every, everybody is surveyed uh, using facial recognition or some other form of uh, technology. So even for China, they were unable to do that, and they had to lock down. The only way they could control this is like lock it down, build giant uh, healthcare centers, test a lot of people. And even when the virus came back, like they tried to eradicate in Wuhan, I think they succeeded in it, but it came back. And they actually re-mandated everyone in Wuhan to get a test done again. So the only way, and even that's what the WHO says, right? The only way to look at this is uh, test, test, test. But in case of uh, challenging this mandatory nature, I think uh, it's something that individuals have to question, keep questioning, because we were consistently questioning the government had to backtrack or man making it mandatory for everyone, except it still remains mandatory in some form in practice when you want to take a flight, when you want to use public public uh, transport, trains, and whatnot. So 
if if your employer is actually forcing you i think you should you do have a right to go to court uh, but but there is this issue that they, they could fire you right and especially in this economy uh well you have to take your chance and i think uh, this is the only way to uh, take back your rights if you can't question it publicly maybe you can file a private complaint with your labor commissioner uh who is the authority who can keep your company in check uh all right so i'm bunching a couple of questions now so uh who is the owner of the app and has there been a responsibility or accountability fixed for this okay so the owner of the app would be the nic national informatics center uh but it was built by few private players now question to ask is whether these private players have access to the entire systems uh, that's something we don't know uh and what form of uh, partnership agreements contracts or any form of uh, legally binding documents i'm saying legally binding very specifically because that's the only documents that brings in liabilities so what happens when say say there is a security issue and the app actually gave away a lot of data there was an incident some hacker has hacked all of this data who takes the primary responsibility the primary responsibility lies with the government but there is a secondary responsibility which is also with the app developers because they are the ones who were involved in building it and the reason i say they are the ones because take this scenario when you when you have uh, an accident of a bridge right you some an engineer has built a bridge and it it there was an accident the bridge uh, got demolished like it cracked or some accident has happened you would actually help help the chief engineer responsible most of the times or you would uh, help the contractor who built the bridge responsible depending upon who is executing it and who is who is ordering the bridge to be built now in this scenario there is no contractor you have a bunch of volunteers and they don't want any risk or liability well but then but then they bring in their uh, the expertise or i don't want even to call their expertise they bring in their uh, biases into uh, while building these systems essentially the app works as these people want it to work it's designed in a particular way because these people have designed it it's like a chief engineer has designed this new bridge uh, which is supposed to be very revolutionary but he forgot to take the wind factors into considerations he only took the earthquake uh, soil scenarios into considerations and you have this heavy wind because of a cyclone and the bridge crashes or even for the lightest of wind either way uh, it depends on how secure or safe you are maintaining these things and the liability does fall on the engineer who designs it or the contractor who builds it in this in this scenario they don't exist uh, i think in the same spirit i think there is connected question uh, uh, this was regard, i mean the previous question was regarding the code and all that uh, but in in the same sense is the data Uh, is the data secured if one uses this app and who would be the custodian of the data whatever data that the app is is collecting so the data is uh with the nic the national informatics center okay so the custodian of data is them but the data is shared with third party researchers through a data exchange system so essentially you have uh uh IIT Madras, which is a partner, which is an academic partner. Sorry, so IIT Madras, which is an academic partner. I think it's Professor Kamakoti at IIT at IIT Madras, who is involved uh, with the project. He, his team rather, gets access to this data. That's the understanding I have because there is a data exchange system. While the custodian is NIC, there are these third-party uh, agencies, institutions, which have access to it. now uh, the other question i frankly do not know is how much access to even state governments have like how much of the data is actually going back to states right like i have no idea about this frankly because there are no reports of it we do not know how the states are using this and that's something uh, 
which maybe some journalists can look up or or uh, maybe the government itself can publish a list of uh, entities and people to whom the uh, there is access to this data but as of now one can say that it's it's a range of people uh, but the government does claim that when it's sharing data to researchers or third parties it is uh, doing what they call the hard anonymization what hard anonymization essentially means is that you are uh, removing personally identifiable data uh, from this you are uh, anonymizing this data and sharing it anonymizing in a way which it can't be reverse de-anonymized uh, but but the fact is their own data sharing protocol says that if anybody tries to de-anonymize this we will cancel their access and you could be uh, liable for penalties uh, the fact that they claim this essentially says that even they don't know if it can be de-anonymized uh, yeah. then this idea of a hard anonymization doesn't exist. So if they are sharing data, and, and the problem in all of this is they're not even informing you that they're sharing a derivative of your data. So they have some raw data they're collecting from you, and they're sharing a derivative of it, right? They're anonymizing it and sharing the anonymized data to a third party. And the government is not actually taking permission from you. It's not even, even informing you that they are sharing this data with third parties. And that's a larger problem. So, uh, one more question is about the, this is about who the government is intentionally sharing. But another question that came in was uh, about the leakages, data leakages that, that I think uh, uh, was the case a few days back. Uh, so and another so, in the same spirit there was also uh, this thing that in the in the uh, agreement in the user agreement there is no liability for the government in case of any data leak so yeah, yeah this this is something that we can discuss so so data leaks and liability is an important point right like so i think when the and i see when when mighty and media open source the app uh, the Secretary of Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology actually claimed that even though we do not have a data protection law, which is in the parliament, we actually implemented the law in spirit, right? That's the claim that he made, that, that we took every security step, we minimized how much data we should collect, we did a lot, we implemented the entire privacy law. That's the claim he made. So the, but, but the privacy law would penalize someone for, uh, for privacy violations, except the privacy uh, law, which is the data protection law, actually says that government has all forms of exemptions. But in case of a data leak, it would be the head of the department which has leaked the data who is liable, according to the upcoming data protection law, which hasn't been passed yet by the parliament. And the leaks were happening primarily at uh, state level, at a municipal level. I think that's, again, an important issue. So, so if Aragese to data is being shared with states, then obviously these people have access to the list of everyone who's positive. But then again, at what scale? Uh, so which is really important. And I will come back to this whole idea that uh, uh, what should be the liability, right? Like when you're proposing these systems without a law, right? Like any technology systems, uh, rather information technology systems is a piece of code. And this code is essentially executing uh, a form of governance, uh, a, a set of uh, steps which are essentially uh, essential for governance and governance as defined in various laws or of the constitution. So you have code which is executing the law without a law. So the code has the power of law, and it can't be doing that without the legislative approval of the parliament, which is we the people. We have to approve this code, and which is why I, I actually say that when they actually open source the app, uh, you have a lot of people who are able to see it, who are able to suggest, if you go onto GitHub and check the app, you see that people are suggesting improvement, they are making questions. There is a direct participation that's happening of this code, uh, which is what happens through the parliament in case of law, and where you can actually approach an MP, which is an indirect form of participation, participatory governance. And 
these systems still need that law without that they are frankly illegal they are executive overreach just like how aadhar came in without a law and you had all these leaks all of these things happened because there was no law and there people were doing whatever they want like making it mandatory uh, making it mandatory for everything and anything that they want which is what is happening with aarogya setu it's because there is no law and i'm not talking about a data protection law i'm talking about a separate law for aarogya setu like there is a separate law for aadhar so uh a few questions who which are sort of correlated uh they're talking about the usefulness of the app so i'll just read them out both of them uh talking about the usefulness of this app Uh, can be uh, hugely useful if it is used for the masses what all other suggestions can we can be given uh, for actual contact tracing that is question 1 question 2 is uh, so tough the app is limiting still contact tracing is making some impact right at this point the app is still uh, contributing something if not everything uh, the government can probably fix this and mm, move forward these are two sort of co- uh, related things if you can just give your comments on that okay so let me cite the whole uh, the way kerala solved coronavirus right like they almost made it to zero they have very low number of uh, coronavirus positive patients and i do not think it was because of aarogya setu it was actually because of their extensive healthcare infrastructure that the state was able to build over the years and manual contact tracing actually played a large role in this because they were able to effectively identify even to the point of actually detaining people when they were trying to run away foreigners especially right so in terms of that the uh, the app is doing something than nothing and i think it's 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 really problematic why does why do we even need this app there is no reason for this app in fact So the, to the other question is is what can the, what can you do i think we don't need to look at technology solutions we need to really look for healthcare solutions uh, on that note i will not say that we don't need scientific solutions we need scientific solutions scientific solutions like vaccines scientific solutions like uh, pharmaceutical medicines but but assuming that code can solve a healthcare crisis is 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 so wrong right it's it's people who solve issues i mean it's it's not a, a piece of machine which is or data that randomly can solve this even with all of this data one has to use it in the right way um, so it's a tool right it, that's what it essentially is so but uh, but if you bring the wrong tool uh, to a crisis right it, it doesn't help you if you need a screwdriver you bring a screwdriver otherwise you bring a stethoscope in this case what people actually need is masks and i don't see the government doing anything actually uh, distributing masks effectively to everyone in the country or actually making them understand which is like trying to educate them that's not happening what you're trying to do is actually force people this by putting lots of ads about aarogya setu which could have been like wear a mask add instead so i actually think it should be a healthcare response and not a technology response i mean it's like if you bring a legal response to this the legal response to this would be like i will bring a law which states that the corona virus it has vanished from the country on papers it has vanished right like that's the legal solution to it but except everyone's dying that's the thing that's happening with the technology solution like arg setu it's like you can claim that it it is going to solve everything but on uh, off in the physical world uh, you would see that people haven't been uh, haven't uh, haven't experienced anything good with this app like the app hasn't helped them in any way uh i'll read i mean i'm bunching a couple of questions again uh whether the app collects information even after installing it is there any possibility for the pay, uh, air passengers to refuse to install the aarogya setu app that is question 1 question 2 is what should be a direct answer when someone forces 
us, us to use the app while traveling or while visiting uh, to other places where the app is mandatory. Yeah. I mean, both of the questions are simple, right? Like, you are being forced to use this app. What do you do? Uh, there's not much that you can do uh, except uh, install it. Uh, people have been trying to evade that by actually saying we don't have a phone. So you can travel without a phone. You declare that uh, you you do not have a phone and you are not COVID positive. So essentially, they won't let you travel if you, your temperature is high, right? Uh, so that's the only solution. Don't want to use it, uh, don't use your phone. As of now, that's the only thing. Because even though they say it's optional, unfortunately, that's not the reality. Uh, there is no other solution. Uh, uh, if you want to install it for a limited period of time, I think you should. Uh, but the concerns are not very for individuals. There's a, this is a larger concern about a society, right? Like, will you be harmed if you install the app? Uh, very less likely. Nobody is talking about individual harm. Everyone's questioning on the larger intention behind the project and whether it helps or how it's a public uh, distraction instead during a time of a pandemic. And for individuals, it could be completely different. So you might as well install it. And last, last few questions, I guess. Uh, is there a sunset clause in this app? As in, if if the, if this will be if this project will be dropped uh, after a point of time when there is no Corona or COVID nineteen? So. There is a sunset clause at some levels, part of the terms and conditions on the data protocol where the government says, oh, we will delete all of this data after 180 days, right? Like, that's the extreme scenario they're saying. Six months, all of this data will go away. Uh, but you can't, A, you can't verify it. Uh, and there is no guarantee that the government's going to shut down this app. Uh, it, any infrastructure, facial recognition, apps, anything, even the physical infrastructure. Like, I mean, look at the ongoing construction that's happened during the lockdown in cities, right? It's it's here to stay. Uh, the assumption that just because there is a law, just because, uh, I mean, it, take the whole other judgment. Supreme Court clearly said private sector can't access other database. But what's happening again? Because it simply exists, right? The infrastructure exists. There is a need for it. They found they, they found a work around it. There's a clear order by the court which said no banks, no mobile companies, can no private players, in fact, can use other. It didn't help. Yeah, uh, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, one is about the code release. Uh, the question is: Is the code released in Git? Uh, by uh, government of India, the same as what the application is, and uh, is the server part uh, also released along with that? Okay, uh, they haven't released the server code yet. They also haven't released the iOS code yet. Uh, on the question of verifiability, the only way one can verify this is uh, through some form of key signing, right? Like uh, you, you have the entire source code when you compile it. You can verify that these two source codes are the same, but that can't be done at this stage. And I think uh, the onus is on the government of India to release those bills, saying that look, this is our build process. Uh, this is the source code, and this is those keys of those app, the, and you can verify it with the keys. Last few, this one, I'm just looking at the question. Yeah, so uh, hi, Srinivas. Should uh, Make My Trip or Go IBBO kind of organizations be involved in making this app? How sure are we that no backdoor arrangements have been left by these organizations in any of these algorithms? Should private players be involved at all? OK, so I am going to look at this as a question in general in building uh, digital platforms of code or software. Uh, in government, inside government, OK? Uh, so the reason you're bringing these private people is that, A, there is a governance failure. Your national informatics center is unable to build these apps, right? 
because they did try to build a similar app, which as I've been telling you, it was called the Corona Coverage, which was there for a while. So whatever happened to that project, there's no transparency. You never told us the, that your NIC was incapable of it or there was something wrong with the project. To my understanding, it was simply their interest to bring in the private sector to experiment on this whole idea of uh, data economy. Uh, but if, if they're saying that NIC is unable to build these things and they need private place to build them, you should hire them inside government, pay them, hire them. This whole idea that, oh, we are not even paying them, they're just volunteering for us is, is not okay because the, the, it removes the liability from them, right? Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at what the US has done you know, in 2008, Obama actually hired a lot of Silicon Valley engineers. He actually personally went and met each of these individuals and asked them to go work with them, work for the government. And these people took a five-year break. They worked inside the government. And essentially, when they were working inside the government, one could file an RTI, and they will still be required to answer to those requests. They're still accountable to, say, the parliament, which is the US Senate and Congress, and uh, and to the courts in US because they are working as go uh, government employees. And uh, if you want to do that, bring in those mechanisms where you can hire people and not necessarily uh, say that, oh, these things can't be built by government. If you're saying they can't be built, maybe you can shut down your entire uh, national information centers. There is no need for it. Let's privatize everything, right? So clearly there was a reason why you set up the National Information Center, and if it's not functioning, what you do is you improve it. You don't hire private people. I mean, you don't get private volunteers. You can even hire private people by releasing an actual tender or a contract. In that scenario, again, this, the contract would still be uh, valid in the court of law, and you can still you still have liabilities inbuilt into the contract. But this idea of volunteers, we won't pay them, but they are the best people in the country. I'm like, who decided these people are the best? Are they claiming they're the best? If we are self-certifying that we are the best, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, that has been proven to be wrong in, in the past scenarios, including Aadhaar or any of those associated infrastructure. Uh, all right. So uh, last two questions. Uh, you have mentioned uh, another app developed by NIC with the same objective. I, and w w why was it withdrawn? And what is your perception on that? That is question one. I'm uh, also uh, reading out the second question. Arogya Setu is like a digital panopticon in the hands of government. What would be uh, what would be the future like if this surveillance mechanism turns to be the new normal? Uh, means if the uh, government brings such digital mechanism even in other form, how our society or de de uh, democratic values will be shaped? Okay, so I will actually not call RFS to a surveillance uh, or rather a political surveillance system. So it's healthcare surveillance. It's a form of surveillance which is actually just uh, and required. What I'm worried about is uh, the way in it happening and how even when you need surveillance uh, so as i was saying disease surveillance right it needs to be done by healthcare professionals you have an entire set of people who are trained to do this which are the epidemiologists but instead uh, you are pushing this whole big data based surveillance which can have dual uses right it could be used for political surveillance as well say as i was citing the whole opposition uh, uh, data being accessible to the government. Uh, that's the, that's a perfectly valid concern. And say some, some, some leader in the opposition, if he doesn't want to install it, he won't install it. Uh, but healthcare surveillance by epidemiologists actually needs to happen. So in that context, I will say we need that. That's what ICDS, the Integrated Center for Disease Surveillance, was supposed to do. Uh, and it failed. It's, it's mm. the, this institution still exists. They're not sharing any data. I think we should question them a lot. Uh, at the same time, as we're questioning Aravya Setu, 
uh, I think the focus needs to shift away. I mean, we all should realize that this app is a dead app. Criticizing it is pointless. If we are actually, I mean, it's important to ask them questions, but over asking them is also is not going to help. The questions rather need to be put to ICDS saying, what are you doing, right? What is the health department doing? What is the health ministry doing, right? So like, for example, Ministry of Electronics and IT can always come back and say, hey, my department is only concerned with collection of data and building software. I'm doing that. If it's health department's problem, I think the health department should look into it. Uh, so the bureaucrats can always pass the buck and do that, right? So as much as we are questioning ROK, I think it's important to question the healthcare uh, concerns. And I think uh, the other question uh, on what happened to the corona coverage, which was built by NIC, I think it was withdrawn because Niti Ayo was primarily interested in this whole health stack. Uh, you would, one would never know. In fact, the question is, uh, did anyone record all of these instances on paper? Maybe one should file an RTI with NIC about the whole corona coverage. Uh, and maybe we will know. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, we have uh, we have I think taken most of the questions. Uh, again, uh, Srinivas, thank you for taking time out of your schedule and joining joining us here on on this uh, discussion. Uh, I also would like to thank all the viewers for uh, uh, having been so interactive over the last half an hour. Uh, I think the question answer session went almost uh, 30, 30 to forty minutes. So once again, Srinivas, thank you, thank you for uh, your time. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, one uh, one announcement uh, before we wrap up. Uh, so uh, to, uh, tomorrow as well on live dot talk, we will have another uh, discussion, another uh, another talk. Uh, the topic of the uh, talk is will the stimulus package revive the Indian economy? And the speaker for tomorrow is Prabir Purthayasa, uh, is president of FSMI and editor in chief at NewsClick. Uh, the session will start at five pm uh, tomorrow evening at uh, live dot talk. We invite all of you to join and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you so much again, one and all. Good night. Thank you.